How are you doing, everybody? Good evening. It's James Debo on um, Discovering New Things with, on Big Condo Radio. And we've got a special guest in the house today. It's Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Renoko Rashidi on the Global African Presence. How are you doing, brother? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good, brother. How are well, you? I'm great anyway. And it's been a long time since I, we've seen each other in the flesh. The last time we seen you was at the Caribbean Center. You put on a hell of a show, the Global African Presence. And unfortunately, we couldn't return, but... This is definitely an anticipated talk. And we're going to go for the global African presence in Asia, the Pacific, and Australia. So I'm also excited. Also, you've got many, many books, and we can go over that soon. But however you want to start, my brother. Well, I did have a few photographs I could show. But basically, you pick the questions, and I'll try to give the answers. I'll try to be concise and I think that there are some other things that you wanted to point out as well. So uh, I'm here at your beck and call. I apologize for last week. The internet in the whole neighborhood just went down for a couple of days. Oh, no there was problem. nothing we could do about it. And then before then, it was the pandemic. Yeah. So I guess the next best thing is what we're doing today with this Zoom uh, interview. And, and hopefully, it'll be productive and people will be receptive to it. Almost definitely, definitely. I mean, a lot of people have been asking, when would you come back? But this is the best we can do f for now anyway. But it's always good to hear you. It's always information. And you've inspired me a lot. I didn't know about these black folks of Asia. Then and you inspired me. I visit these people myself and started visiting. And you are definitely my grandmaster teacher anyway. That's what I've definitely got to say. And I told you that last time. I said, you have the Dr. Ben, you have the John Andrew Clarks, Shaker and the Diops. And most definitely from this year, I remember I told you, you are considered a, definitely a grandmaster. How many countries have you visited now, my brother? Well, right now I'm saying 125. I got stuck somewhere between 123 and 126. I seem to have lost a couple. Amazing. And most of those countries have been during the last 20 years. Amazing. You know, I started traveling in the 1980s, but really beginning in 1998, while living in Texas, I decided to travel and I decided that I was not going to stop until something stopped me, a personal uh, you know, issue or uh, a war or a financial setback. And what happened was this pandemic stepped in. So now I've been sheltering in place here in Southern California since March. Yeah. And the good yeah. thing about it is with these new social media platforms, Zoom and StreamYard and Google Meet and yeah, WebEx. Now I find myself doing things that I've never done before. And the advantage is I can do what I enjoy the most, I think, and that is just sit in my studio and talk and show pictures. The next time we do this, I want to make sure that we're ready to show photographs. Okay. And we can illustrate the Black presence in these various parts of the world that we're talking about. I think people would enjoy that. Okay. Now, I've got a couple of questions from some people, but if you think it's best to leave it near the end, and we can... What do you it's think? It's completely up to you. It's completely oh, up to you. I'd say we'll go near the end with that, if that's okay. That's now, fine. Okay. Now, do you want to... And we'll, go with, we'll speak about your books also near the end. Okay, I want to start off as in... We're going to start off with Asia now. So... The first place I'm going to think of is we can deal with the Middle East. Well, some people say the Middle East is Africa. So I don't know. Well, we can deal with Samaria. And I think we should deal with soon as Western Asia. I think we begin with there. All right. Well, let's just give a <clears throat> kind of a framework. Yeah. Um, a roadmap. Okay. Let's identify what we mean by the African presence in Asia. When we talk about the African presence in Asia, talking about all of those black populations, many of which originated in Africa, but others um, evolved, you might say, in Asia and has significant impact on Asian civilization. So we're talking about the first populations of Asia as coming out of Africa anywhere from 60 to 100,000 years ago. Okay. The first, what we could call an African diaspora, and it's important to point this out because this is tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade. I think when a lot of people talk about the African diaspora, that's really what they're talking about. They're talking about one or two things, either Africans 
who are outside of Africa as a result of enslavement. That's one, that's the majority view. And then the other is more contemporary and that will be Africans who have left Africa most recently because of the rape and pillage and plunder of Africa. So you have the children of Africa in many parts of the world just going looking for what they would perceive as a better, a better life. So okay. in Asia, you have the first diaspora. And this begins out of East Africa, perhaps out of e even Egypt, tens of thousands of years ago. And then you have the role that Black people, African people, have played in the development of classical civilizations in Asia, whether it be the um, uh, Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, you know, the Sumerians, or whether it be the Indus Valley civilization, Dravidians or Proto-Dravidians, and you can say something similar about the uh, Yangtze River Valley and the Yellow River Valleys in China, where you have great civilizations that developed in antiquity, or even Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Myanmar. And then you have African people who, just like the Americas, or just like the African diaspora, um, as a result of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, you have something similar to that in Asia. You have African people in much more recent times taken to places like Iraq, Iran, Turkey, various parts of the Arabian Peninsula, India, et cetera. And so you have different waves of African people. In fact, we could say that history is the movements of people. And those movements have been unrelenting since, um, I guess we could even say the beginning of time. Okay. And then beyond okay. that, we're talking about Australia, and the Pacific Islands. And of course, yeah. we're talking yeah. about the indigenous people or the first people of Australia. And we're talking about yeah. sisters and brothers in places like Melanesia, many of whom say they come from Africa. Oh, and my then we that. by yeah. talking a, a little bit about more recent interactions with them as part of the, the global African community and the global African experience. Well, it's, I'm happy that you, you explained that way because when I read the scientists, they'll talk about, well, they left Africa and that was it till slavery. Now, when they explain one wave, I've seen like people explain, you really see it, multiple waves left Africa, but then one single wave populated the world. I mean, wouldn't it be multiple waves? Maybe if you say they left 90,000 years ago, what would stop them going 70,000 years after, well, 70,000? or 60,000 years ago, up to 10,000 years ago. So I'm happy that you're highlighting a lot of these things where it just seems that we just get this, Africans left the Africa, went all around the world, then we're captured in slavery. And, you know, it's, I'm happy. So we, we touch on a country like, say, the, the Dravidians in India. Uh, the Dravidians, what time period would you say the Dravidians came to, into India? Well, it's very, very difficult to say. Only because um, you know? I've seen, I watched the program, I watched something on with a friend of yours. Um, he was an Indian man and he was explaining about uh, the Dravidians came from the Mediterranean area about possibly 8,000 years ago or like they've mixed with the indigenous people of India. That may be. So what we're talking about are, are two different things. Okay. One is we're talking about the initial wave of, of African people who settled into Asia. Uh, okay. And a lot of these uh, sisters and brothers you can find in places like the uh, Andaman Islands in the Indian Ocean or in um, Malaysia and Thailand and the Philippines. These are the most ancient populations. But when, we, when it comes to the people called the Dravidians and the development of Indus Valley civilization, that might not have been sparked by a direct movement from Africa into Asia. That might have been something that was developed by the descendants of those ancient, ancient populations. The right. way it mixed in with other population right. time. But if we look at the art, if we look at the physical anthropology, okay. if we look at eyewitness accounts, okay. we can easily attest to an ancient population that developed or at least sparked those great civilizations. Ivan Van Sertima used to say all the time, Renoko, it's one thing to say that you were first, which is clear now. We know this based on DNA analysis um, uh, in particular, but it's another thing he would say, 
to be able to point out what you did. And oh, so yeah. we're able to do both of those. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so you, I've been to a place called Sri Lanka and I went to visit the Vida tribes and I went to go to a place called Dambane. Now with Sri Lanka, how much is that would be very similar to Southern India, would you say? Well, Sri, Sri Lanka, formerly known as Ceylon, under the British rule, famous for its massive tea uh, plantations, made up of different populations. The majority population is a Sinhalese. And then, of course, you have Tamils, who I guess come directly from uh, India itself, but a much more ancient population, as you pointed out, are the so-called Vedas. And these, yeah. this yeah. population is similar, in my estimation, to the Aboriginal Australians. So you okay. have a, a, a wave of short-statured Black people like Looks the similar. so-called pygmies of Central Africa. Mm. And then you have another exodus, if you want to call it that, out of Africa. And these are made up of people who look like Aboriginal Australians with straight to wavy hair, a little taller, but black people nevertheless. And so I think that the population of the ancient population, what we could even call, if you want, the first people of Sri Lanka represented that last wave. These Australian looking sisters and brothers. In fact, the term that we could generally use is Australoid uh, because uh -huh. India and Australia is where this physical type, I think, can still be found in its most original form. Also, we're uh, leaving the Indo, Indo Aryan migration and attacks from Central Asia on horses that came into India. Was it around about 1500 BC? Uh, on a, yeah, 1500 BC, perhaps system a little or something. earlier. You know, maybe even a little later than that. Of course, okay. that is very much disputed now by some oh, people, particularly in India, who are saying that never really happened and that the people called the Aryans have always been there. I think that this is what we could call a classical revisionist um, depiction of history. And that is that the people who are in power have decided to rewrite history from their perspective. Now, this is something that's very, very important. Now, I don't really yeah. give a damn about what European scientists say. Me too. Because I don't think it's accurate. I don't yeah. think that we should allow other people who don't have our, be our, our best interest at heart to tell us our story. And this yeah. is one of the things I was thinking about when we first opened up the program. For example, if we go to a place like Fiji, where I believe you've been, yeah. And you talk to the people, they will tell you they come from Africa. I'm your They're witness. They're very, very clear on that. Definitely. But if you read the works of, of European anthropologists, they will give you a very different story. They would say they came from some part of Southeast Asia yeah. or something like that. I think that we have to be prepared to listen to the people that we're writing about and not impose our sense of history and values on them. That is very Eurocentric. And I don't want to fall into that particular trap. I believe that African people are the only ones that can ultimately mm -hmm. tell the story of African people. Other people can contribute to it, of course. And we want all the information we can, we can get. But ultimately, the people that we are talking about, in this case, Black people, have to be able to be the final arbiters, I think, and final storytellers of their history and their story. And well, that's the way it goes. It's a lot about... Mm. Jewish history. I've studied World War II. I know a lot about the, the Holocaust, but I've never been invited to come and participate in a lecture on that subject. In other words, it seems to me that all other people write their histories. Black people, for some reason, seem to be perfectly comfortable with other people telling us who we are and what we've done and putting labels on us. Yeah. And I deeply mm -hmm. resent that. Well, I can definitely relate to you about uh, Fiji. I've been there twice, and I'm definitely a witness to the amount of people that said they came from Africa. Now, I, here's what I said to one of them. I asked, are the, are the, are the other tourists aware that you come from Africa? They said, we don't tell them. And I thought that was interesting. So basically, when they've seen me or you, they basically just tell us we're African. But I said, you need to, you need to, don't, you don't have to fit in with anybody. You just tell them where you're from. A lot of the white tourists that came, they said, they said, they don't tell them where they're from. I don't know why. Well, that's not my experience. 
Yeah. Now I've been in Fiji twice. Yeah. And the first time I went by myself, I went into a lot of communities and just talked to people on the street. But on one particular day towards the end of my tour, I found myself on a, a bus with all European tourists, white Americans. I was the yeah. only black person yeah. around. I wasn't the happiest person in the world. They didn't seem terribly friendly. And we went to a place called the Sese village or the Vesese community. And this apparently, or the way it was built, it was a place where the um, native Fijians first landed when they came from Africa. So I was very excited just to be able to go there. And there was um, a Fijian tour guide, a woman, a sister, and she addressed everybody, including myself and all the other white American tourists and says, you know, we come from Africa. Amazing. And we speak Amazing. in African language. And she was very, very clear and upfront about it. Right. But I'm saying right. that if we look, for example, at the, let's think for a minute about the first people of Asia, the ones we find in the Andaman Islands and the Philippines, et cetera. All the books I've ever seen about them, and there are many, many books about them, are anthropological studies. None of them, it seems to me, really tell the these folk from their perspective. And I think that that's something that we need to change. I do believe in primary research whenever possible. Yeah. And yeah. I think that we have to respect the traditions, even though all traditions of the people that we have in mind. Otherwise, we find ourselves imposing, as I said, our own sets of values and parameters on folk. And I think that's a bit unfair. Also, um, I went over to Tonga. Um, I went over to Tonga Islands um, after Fiji, and I was asking them where do you believe you come from, and what I got from them was they just point to Fiji. Well, I have to say that Polynesia, at least that part, Samoa, uh, Tonga, um, Tahiti, I haven't been to. I've been okay. to almost all of the islands in Melanesia. And, mo and quite a few of them in Micronesia. Uh -huh. But in terms of the Polynesian islands, I've only been to New Zealand and of course, Hawaii a bunch of times. I do know that among the Tongans and Samoans, there is also a kind of a, an ideological battle, if you will, about racial origins. And yeah. some of them I think, yeah. are prepared to embrace what might uh, be their African or black roots. And others are just the opposite of that. Well, All well, of this can't. suggests to me that mm. for the most part, mm. the history of Black folk around the world, you could even say world history, is yet to be written. Yeah. Only, I think, the, yeah. the tip of it has been written. So we have a lot of work to do, and in many ways, that's very exciting. Well, I remember the first time I seen Renoko Rashidi yourself was when I was in Hawaii. I was, I was having a research about the Hawaiian people, and I seen an interview with you where you were in Hawaii, and the exact same reason you said you want to go to Fiji because you felt that you wanted to see more of the culture because of, you know, Hawaii's it's a bit different than how it probably once was. It was an, it was an old interview where you said you were given a lecture in Hawaii and you said you, you want to go to Fiji because if you want to see, you want to see more of the South Pacific culture, the, the African presence, which that was my same reason of when I was in Hawaii, I felt I've got to go to Fiji because especially when you, I was, you said that they came from Africa and I was a witness to your work and I was just amazed when the amount of people in Fiji said, we come from Africa. So with Hawaii, because I went to Honolulu, you'd probably be in like all parts of Hawaii. How did you find the Hawaiian people when you went different areas? I didn't find them particularly friendly and welcoming. Mm. You know, in some cases, yeah, but what I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this or not is that the native Hawaiians are really a minority in Hawaii. True, yeah. And most of the people who I see in Hawaii, particularly in Honolulu and places like that, have come quite recently. And mostly yeah. from Asia, from the Philippines, from Japan, from China, et cetera. You know, and they've come largely for economic reasons. So I did not find the, and have not found the native Hawaiians to be particularly welcoming. But it is interesting in that if you look at the images of people like Kamehameha uh, and the Hawaiian uh, royal family in the 19th century, they're very, very dark people. Yeah. I think yeah. we can say with, with certainty now that at one time, the entire world was black. 
until rel and quite until relatively recently, within the last few thousand years. And Hawaii is no exception to that. There was a tradition that has been pointed out to me, I don't know how accurate it is, by a native who told me that when Kamehameha the Great, a powerful king of the early 19th century, was attempting to unify the Hawaiian Islands, he ran into trouble. And according to this particular account, sent back to Africa for reinforcements. Wow. Then you have the tradition that the first people of Hawaii, I think they're called the Minahini or something like that, were also short-statured Black people. And so I think the further um, east in the, well, let's, I guess it would be east, the further west, actually, if you're looking at it from my perspective, you go into the Pacific Islands, the more Africa the people are. Yeah. There's a reason that the South Pacific is also called Melanesia, uh, which means uh, the Black uh, Islands, and that the biggest part of Melanesia, in fact, the largest island in that region is New Guinea. Wow, New Guinea. And a term that's also applied by Europeans to several of the nation states in Africa today. You have Guinea Conakry or French Guinea. You have Guinea Bissau colonized by the Portuguese. Um, you have uh, Equatorial Guinea colonized by the Spanish. And then these Europeans go into the South Pacific, I guess in the 17th century, and see these black people, clearly black people, and refer to the island as New Guinea. And so to me, this is one of the most exciting areas of research. Even the great Marcus Garvey himself, and believe me, I'm a Garveyite, did not seem to look at the black presence in the Pacific. But these, I've met sisters and brothers in the Solomon Islands, in Fiji, and other parts of Melanesia who say beyond the shadow of a doubt that they come from Africa. And unlike a lot of black populations, you don't have to beat them over the head with it. Yeah, They're very, very proud yeah. of it. And I think that we really need to pull them in as far as Pan-Africanism is concerned. My thing yeah. is a global yeah. black community that extends from Africa also eastward into Asia, into Australia, and into the Pacific. Because it was a place called Guam I went to in Micronesia and I was speaking to them. I found a couple of the indigenous people, but a lot of them would come from the islands of Yap and places like that. Now, a lot of the lighter ones were saying, we're not Micronesians. We are the Chimoras, the mixture from, like you said, mm -hmm. the Europeans, the Spanish or whoever came in. And I was just like, and he was trying to like, I was, he was, he was asking me, why do I want to visit the indigenous, the real people? And I'm saying, because I'm into history and I'm, and I'm black just like they're black. So I'm going to be looking for, looking for the same people. So and it very, like you've just said about the bit of an anti-African, you know, you, you seem to get that in um, places that you've gone in there. So how did you find Micronesia? I mean, because, you know, you've got many different parts of Micronesia. Yeah. Well, you know, you have these three massive island chains in the Pacific. Yeah. You have Melanesia, which is New Caledonia, which is still a French colony, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, West Papua New Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Fiji, seems like I'm leaving one out. And, th and that means, Melanesia literally means the Black Islands. And then you have Micronesia, which means the small islands. Yeah. And they are also divided into different parts. You have, I guess, um, uh, I don't know if it's Saipei or Saipan, okay. and you have Guam, and you have the northern part, and then you have the southern part, which consists of places like Chuk or Truk, um, Kosrai, Yap, and Palau. Now, these places, particularly Palau or Belau, is very Africoid, even though that's changing now, too, because you have many people from the Philippines who are there as workers, and you have people from um, uh, Japan coming in largely as tourists. These reflect, these places reflect a more black population. Yeah. And then of course you have Polynesia. The reason I bring that up like that is because again, Europeans have come and designated these areas so that you have a place like New Zealand, which is very close to Australia, lumped together with Samoa, Tonga, Hawaii, and Tahiti, which is on the other side of the Pacific. So I think that 
we have to begin to uh, develop a new frame of reference. And so it depends on where you go. I fell in love with the people of Chuk and the people of Palau. Wow. I felt like they were wow. be my brothers and sisters, but I did not have that same vibe when I went into the North. I didn't feel that way when I went to uh, Guam. I didn't feel that people were anti-African in Guam. I just didn't really feel that connection with them that I felt with the sisters and brothers in Palau and Chuk. So it depends on the parts of Micronesia that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Since we're on the subject of um, on the Pacific, um, I might as well pop one question in. This is from um, a cousin of mine, Daniel Estridge. He was at the Renoka Vishidi event last time. And he wants to ask a question of where do the Maoris come from? I don't know where the Maori trace their roots. I, you know, uh, New Zealand or Aotearoa, which apparently is the indigenous name, is very close to Australia. Okay. So I went there 16 years ago. Yeah. I was celebrating my 50th birthday and I wanted to be as far from the United States as I could be. So I spent most of that time in Australia and from Tasmania, I flew to New Zealand and I spent several days there. I went to the major museum and I talked to some of the people. And one thing they made very, very clear to me, talking about the Maori now, is that they didn't have anything to do. There was no connection whatsoever that they had with the indigenous Australians. Okay. And so it's difficult for me to say where they actually come from. Again, okay. also, you have different groups of, of sisters and brothers in New Zealand. Some I've really bonded with and who have actually reached out to me. And others are very, very distant. Let yeah. me tell you a quick story about Australia. I was invited to Australia for the first time in 19... My goodness. I guess it was 1996 interacted with some um, native uh, uh, Australians, some Aboriginal Australians, and they were having a big conference and they invited me among others to come and be a keynote speaker at this big indigenous people's conference. And I couldn't go. I signed a contract to go to Egypt and lecture on a cruise ship. Mm. And they were not mm -hmm. gonna let me out of that contract. So right. the sisters and brothers in Australia told me not to worry about it that they were gonna have another conference in two years. And in the meantime, just send anybody I wanted to, and he would be an a, a, a all expense paid guest and he'd speak at the conference. So I did. I sent a buddy of mine over there, a great scholar. And after he got back from Australia and I got back from Egypt, I called him, I said, uh, James, how did his name is James Brunson, great scholar. James, how did it go? He said, it didn't go well. I said, why not? He says, because these sisters and brothers don't see themselves as African. Okay. And they don't think they come from Africa. Oh. They're not anti African, but they think that they've always been in Australia. So that really bothered me because I want all black folk to say I'm African, I'm black, and I'm proud, put their fist in the air. So I talked to my guru, a great scholar named John Henry Clark, a man I had tremendous respect for. Oh, and I said, he said, Renoka, what's wrong? I said, Dr. Clark, a friend of mine went to Australia, interacted with the indigenous Australians. They say they're not African. What do you think? He says, Renoka, about it. He said, I can show you the blackest person in New York City, the blackest person in Harlem, who will say I'm not African. He says, wait until Africa gets strong. Oh, yeah. And then even you will be surprised at who identifies with Africa. So when the image of Africa changes and the power of Africa grows, I think that a lot of folk who don't see themselves as African right now will be glad to say, yeah, I'm from Africa. What is an example we can use for that? South yeah. Africa. That's it. You used to have That's people it. call themselves Boers, Europeans, Afrikaners. Yeah. And now yeah. that uh, apartheid has been officially abolished, and you have majority black government, even those very many of those very white people are now saying they are African. I think one of the things that we have to do, and I have not had great success with it, is we have to define what an African is. Yeah. And for that yeah. matter, who is a black person? What constitutes black and African identity? If all humanity can ultimately trace their roots to Africa, you can make the argument that we are all African if you wanted to pursue that. 
or at least you'd be able to say that even white people have African roots. Is it that we have become so obsessed with race and color that we take it to an, an to absurdities? And these are discussions I think that we need to have. We need to have them as a black community first, and then we need to pursue it on a global level. But I think that we have to have these internal discussions and begin to define for ourselves and label for ourselves, and then we can branch out and have a, lot, a broader a conversation with other people in the rest of the world. We see with, um, I mean, I wanna ask one last question on that area of, I wanna ask a question about Australia, then I wanna go to Asia then. Um, so, you know, there's different types. When I was in Australia, I seen some people really tight hair, like people like in Papua New Guinea, then seen curly hair, and then I seen people with very straight hair, I've seen quite a few different, different looks. I mean, when I was researching, I've seen um, that they found that 11% or something of Aboriginal Australians have Indian in their DNA from about 4,000 years ago. So I don't know if that explains of different mixtures. Well, for one thing, we're talking about an entire continent. True. When I talk about a little country, talking about an entire continent, yeah. and the people are not monolithic. Yeah. Just like all the Maori are not are not the same. I That's think right. that what we do is we make a mistake by mm. lumping all of these populations. And then different groups of people, black people, if you will, came to Australia at different times. According yeah. to the uh, authorities that I've looked at, at the time of the European, the British invasion of Australia in 1788, there were something like 600 indigenous nations, 600. So I think that we, make a mistake, perhaps, by lumping all of these folk together as though they're monolithic. Same thing for Africa. Right. Africa is a continent. Yeah. And yet we talk yeah. about the Africans as though they are a small monolithic community. Yeah. Africa. But a sister and brother in Senegal, a Wolof, is not the same as a sister and brother in uh, South Africa, Koza, yeah. or in Ara, or a Congolese. There are cultural differences and we're trying to make Africa one. But we also have to recognize that everybody is not the same. They're not monolithic. And I think that we have to look at the differences as well as the similarities and see where we go from there. Okay, now we're gonna deal with, um, well, let's go to China. We're uh, going to China now. So. Where do you begin with uh, China, like the first peoples of China, and then obviously we could take us to the Shia dynasty or the Shang dynasty, then later the Zhao dynasty. We can deal with, we start off from the first people of China, first of all. Well, you do have uh, physical anthropological studies that indicate a very, very ancient Africoid or black population in China. This is based on um, physical anthropology. And Chinese scholars have written about that. And you also have more recently um, DNA analysis and I guess blood analysis, which suggests that the people of China as a whole have African roots or African DNA. But certainly we can point to a black presence and African presence in at least four historical dynasties in China. One would be the Shang dynasty which comes to us about 1700 BC, lasts several hundred years. And you can find at least in a certain phase of the Shang, of the history of the Shang dynasty, Africa looking artifacts, as well as skeletal remains. Yeah, and yeah. then number two, I've been yeah, able yeah. to personally, and I'm doing a webinar this weekend, 27th and 28th on the African presence in China. I mean, the African presence in Asia. And I'll show a lot of pictures. You can identify black folk what are called black acrobats. Maybe they were from Southeast Asia, but black people nevertheless with woolly hair, what I call happy to be nappy hair in the Tang Dynasty. That's about 600 years into the common era. And then during the Yuan Dynasty, the dynasty dominated by Kublai Khan, you can find a black presence there too. We know this based on the art. Mm -hmm. There's an image, for example, in the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, it clearly shows a black man there. There's another painting, and I have not seen this one. I hope to go. There's another painting in Taiwan that shows black people in close proximity, clearly black people, black men in close proximity to Kublai Khan of the Yuan Dynasty. 
And then you have in the Ming Dynasty images of Bodhidharma, the black man who apparently took martial arts from India to the Far East. Mm -hmm. And so you can you have a lot of evidence of that in China. You have reports over the years. The book that uh, really made me want to be a historian was Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. And in this book, he points out that at one time, there were so many Black people in China that they formed their own kingdom. Right. All these things need to be fleshed out in research. I would say that China, there has been a kind of an ethnic cleansing. Yeah. And those yeah. ancient Black populations have been absorbed or wiped out or pushed to the side, marginalized, and their existence has been denied. So all of these areas, whether it be China, the Pacific Islands, Australia, everything deserves a much greater scrutiny from people with an African-centered mindset. We must prepare teams of scholars, teams of researchers to go out and do the kind of research that we need to uh, reconstruct our history. And not just a part of it, but the totality of it. As I pointed out earlier, I think the majority of our history has not yet been written. And why is it not? Because we haven't written it. I think we're waiting for other people to write our story for us. And if we do that, we're going to get their perspective. And we're bound to go wrong. And that includes everything from ancient Egypt into the African presence in Asia, Australia, and the Pacific that we're talking about today. OK. I want to ask one question about the, Af uh, the sh sh in Japan like the Black Samurai, and then I want to move straight to Southeast Asia from there. Uh, well, Sheikh Sheik Job talked about, he used a proverb, and that is, uh, to make a good samurai, one must have a bit of black blood. Yeah. And there's another version of the proverb that reads, for a samurai to be brave, uh, half the blood in his veins must be black. Now, nobody that I'm aware of has black blood. <laughs> so what is the symbolism of that? These um, proverbs have been used to suggest a black presence in the history of Japan. You have now um, stories, a book that's recently come out within the last couple of years. And apparently there's a movie being talked about, about a black man from Mozambique named Yasuke, or Yasuke, mm -hmm. who was supposed to have been the first African samurai. But there's also tradition that in the sixth century, uh, perhaps the seventh century, the armies of Japan were led by a quote-unquote Negro general named Sakanoe Tamua Mararo, who led the armies of Japan to victory against a hereditary enemy, the Ainu. And then you have the image of Fudo Mayo. Fudo Mayo is the, one of the five wisdom kings in Japanese mythology. And Fudo Mayo is portrayed as black. His name means the immovable, and he's the patron of the samurai. And you always see him black skin with an upturned sword and happy to be nappy hair. Now, I'm not saying he's black, but if he's not black, why would he be portrayed as black? Exactly. Is blackness here ethnic or is it symbolic or is it both? Is it perhaps even metaphysical? But a key thing would be to immerse ourselves in Japanese culture and understand what the symbolism of the color black is to Japanese at least in these particular time periods. So all of these things suggest the enormity of the kind of work that needs to be done if we are going to really be serious about who we are and what we've done as a people all over the world. Okay, we wanna move into Southeast Asia now. Now, there's a lot of these um, indigenous peoples and well, some people call them tribes. Like I went to see the Mani tribe in Thailand and I've seen the Etta in the Philippines, Orange Asli tribe in Malaysia, also, now in Vietnam, I went to the north of Vietnam and they look more like the Mongoloid type. These were the Hmong. Yeah. I think I I think I took the wrong route. And he wasn't very friendly at all. I don't know which peoples did you visit in Vietnam? Did you go more south or was it north as well? I've been in all parts of Vietnam. Which I did meet a group of people in central Vietnam called the Cham, and I didn't feel any connection with them at all. Same they yourself. Particularly friendly. Yeah. But maybe you can't just pop in and pay a quick visit and expect these folks to open up to you. Maybe we we need to do a lot more research than that. Yeah. I remember yeah. when I was coming up, I had friends and family members who were in the US Army in Vietnam. 
and many of them would tell me about the black people that they met. And they told me just the opposite of that, that they were very friendly, that they really opened up to them. I think one of my colleagues actually married one of these women. Wow. So I guess it just depends on the time period that you're talking about. It depends on, um, on many things. Now, I have met these other short statured black people in India and um, what we might call the indigenous people of India or ancient people in India in any way. And the relationship is just the opposite of that. Very friendly, really, really opened up to me and made it clear that there was a bond that we had based on race, based on ethnicity. And I would think that if we were to spend more time in Southeast Asia, and we're really serious about it, like Cambodia, for example. Oh, yeah. The Khmer's, I think that the um, experience might be very different, so. Yeah, good ones. Angkor Wat was amazing. It was amazing. Now, you actually did visit the money? Yeah, I visited yes. the money. I took me... It took me, I went by myself. It took me seven hours. I took three buses because I done this, when I was doing trips, I didn't like doing the tours because I felt like I'm being ripped off. It's very expensive. Plus as well, the etta in the Philippines, we, what we done, we just hired a driver and then um, he took us in there with a the car, but he said, I'm not your tour, man. You're going to do the tour on yourself. But it was a lot better. There was no rush. It was more natural as well. And um, it was amazing, the money. So, so what was what was your interaction like? with these sisters and brothers in Southeast Asia? It was a lot better than then, than the ones I met in Vietnam. Basically, just it's just looking at, like, in the mirror. Both of us, it's like it's like we can read each It's like a spiritual connection. Yes, and I, yeah. I can't really describe it. It's like, well, you understand what I mean, you've been there, but it's like, they, they can look in my eyes, they look in their eyes, and it's like, we, we're seeing it, we're seeing it, we're seeing something. Maybe they're wondering, wonder if he's been through oppression in the past, or like, and I'm wondering the same with them. And I can see, well, it's true. We both, we have, we've all been through it. And it's just amazing to see them. I mean, I took, got some video footage and I was just really excited in there. Sometimes you might get, because I got there in the nighttime, you see, in Thailand. I didn't plan to get there in the nighttime. I was just by myself and he said, oh, there's no more buses to come back, so you must stay up here. So I had to eat, I ate with them, and then I stayed like in a local hut, maybe about 10 minutes away. But they were very, very friendly though. Very friendly, the money, and dieta friendly. And um, we would do Orange Asli, they were very friendly in Malaysia. But like I say, in Vietnam, I didn't get that same response. It was very like, people barely want to look at you, they look away and, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, you know exactly how it is. It's it's very. I know exactly. how it is, brother. I've had that. I had that experience in Vietnam, but I also had a similar experience um, with the uh, people called the Ainu in Japan. Now, some okay. people who have never been with them, I think, mm -hmm. believe that the Ainu A I N U are the um, descendants of ancient Black people, ancient African people. And so I spent a little time with them and I didn't feel any connection with them whatsoever. Yeah. But those sisters and brothers that I met in India and also to a lesser extent, the Khmer's of Cambodia, very, very different. And yeah. you just felt yeah. the spiritual connection from the jump, not only a, yeah. a, 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 a common a phenotype. Yeah. It's a bond. Like you knew that they were family. I met a sister an elder in a community of so-called tribal people in Northern Kerala. And these were definitely black people phenotypically, short-statured sisters, uh, short-statured black folk. And this elder came up to me as I was about to leave and she said something I'll never forget. She said through a series of translators, I know you are not from here. That was an understatement. Okay. But, <laughs> and that you must be from somewhere far, far away but I feel as though you are a part of me and I'll never forget you. And even now, when I think about that, I get very emotional and teary eyed. It's a heck of a thing to be thousands of miles from the place you call home, from the place that yeah. you travel yeah. from, to be among people that you never, that you had never seen or heard of before. And for them to embrace you and say, I feel like you are part of me. That's a very, very, very deep thing.
I was and those are the kind of studies I'd like to see more of us engaged in. And at this point, I don't see a lot of emphasis on that in our community. One of the things I think that we must struggle to do is to create a level of excitement and passion about our history, about wanting to know, and about reconnecting as a family all over the world. So I would think a lot of sisters and brothers, a lot of people in general, would think you are crazy Yeah. <laughs> go by yourself to Thailand and the Philippines and Malaya. They must say, what's wrong with you? I had a person tell me, a member of my own family, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I was uh, lamenting the fact that because of the virus, yeah. I haven't been able to travel like I once did. And she said, well, you've been to most of these places already. I don't understand why you would want to, why you would want to go back. And so for a lot of people, they just don't get it. But for mm -hmm. some of us, there's a drive and a passion and we live it and we wake up in the morning. At least I do thinking about it, think about it all day. Yeah. Dominic, let's go to bed. Then. And I want to know how we can inject that same level of enthusiasm and excitement into more people in our community, particularly the young people. Mm. so that they also have that same passion. Like we have a passion for the soccer game, yeah. the football yeah. game, the NBA. We want to know about the Royals. We want to know about personalities. How can we take that same level of passion and inject it in our community so that people just can't wait to get information about who we are and what we have done? If we can do that, especially among the young people, we're 95% of the way home in terms of liberating our minds. And you know what they say, if you liberate your mind, it will follow. I found in Indonesia as well, mm -hmm. um, I didn't actually go into the rainforest and all, but I've seen a lot of people very Africoid looking there. Um, did you, what did you find in Indonesia? Did you go into any rainforest there or any, what did you have? No, I've been in Indonesia two days. One is central Java, which is where a lot of the major temples are, Borobudur. And then there's another one called, I think called the Prambanan, uh, uh, some temples in central Java. And of course, I've been to the tourist spot, Bora Bora. Is it Bora Bora? I'm trying to recall, there's a big tourist spot. It may be Bora Bora, I don't know. Borneo. It doesn't really matter, but to answer you, no, 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 not Borneo. At least that, that's not where I went. But I'm saying that, um, no. I have not encountered any real black folk in Indonesia. Now, Indonesia consists of something like 200 million people and it's scattered over much of Southeast Asia. Yeah. In fact, yeah. maritime Southeast Asia. And so there, are, I'm sure I know a lot of different black people there, but I have not interacted with any there. Okay, we're, we're coming near to the end. Um, if if uh, we can just ask a few questions, if that's okay. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, okay. So let me go now. Now there's a question from Chase, and he, it's about um, is it Khalif X Califia? I know we're not on the topic of America, but um, it's about um, Queen Califia in California. Yeah. Well, there's a tradition coming from a book that was published in Toledo in Spain in 1516. Fact or fiction? That California is named after um, a black woman or a series of black women, black okay. women. And apparently California was a celestial paradise ruled over by black women, wealthy in gold. And I believe one of them is called Califia and she was a queen. Even uh, Disneyland in Southern California, not far from where I live, they have a, a theme related to uh, Califia. And so that's a legend, but you know, I think every legend has a kernel of, of truth to it. And that's okay. something that uh, we could easily pursue. Okay, but next time when we ever have it on you again, we we could do ancient America and we can touch on that another time. But if I can go to some of the questions, okay. Now sure. we've got a question from Raz Congo. And the question is, um, he wants to know about uh, the origin of human species outside of religion or outside of Darwinism. There's countless possibilities in particular human life that was seeded in, in the planet, what's your personal view on who, our species, where we came from? Like, did we come from apes? Did we, you know, what? Well, I think that people, when they talk about evolution, they make a mistake. Yeah. And a lot of people assume that we come from apes or monkeys. 
Mm. I think if you really look at evolution, and I take it very seriously, we would agree that apes, monkeys, humans have a common ancestor. Okay. That we do not okay. evolve from apes, but that um, we have a common ancestor. I do believe in evolution. I do believe that Africa is the parent continent of humanity. Yeah. That yeah. there's only one race, the human race, which originated in Africa and diffused throughout the rest of the world. I don't have any doubt about that. Okay, we go to the next question though. Okay. This was a question from, okay. Um, for the younger generation, this is from Ashley, they're both actually my sister. For the younger mm -hmm. generation traveling to Australia, Asia, and Africa, where can they find out about the indigenous peoples or the, or the if they want to learn about the archaeology? Well, if you're really serious, before you take one of these trips, and I've learned this through experience, do some research. That's right. Do I'm some study. Right. Yeah. Take some time. Now, yeah. you were perhaps lucky, and I've been fortunate a few times, when you go to a place and you happen to encounter black folk or you go into a museum and you find artifacts that are important to you, et cetera. Yeah. But the best thing to do is to do some research, do some study. And if you can contact some, some sisters and brothers in these places before you go, you can even do an internet research mm -hmm. uh, and find out where the black populations are. If you were to go to Australia, for example, there are three areas I would recommend you easily. You can go into what is called the Red Center. This is in the center of Australia. You can go to the area Uluru or Ayers Rock, and you can go to Alice Springs. That's a black concentration center. Or you could go north into the area around Darwin. You will find black folk there. If you go into Sydney, there's a group of black people who live in Sydney, traditionally in an area called uh, Redfern. Local people just call it the block. There are similar black populations in Victoria and South Australia. So do some research. You can even reach out and contact me if you like, Renoco at hotmail.com. Anybody who's interested, please, James, give them my uh, contact information okay. and I'll see if I can help facilitate a trip so that it's as productive as possible. Okay. A question from Nadra Elliott. Uh, do the various groups of the indigenous peoples around in Southeast Asia or Australia or any of these, do they know what part of Africa they originated from? I don't think so. Again, you're generalizing. Yeah. So yeah. we'd have to find a specific group. But I had a, a student of mine, a colleague of mine, who went to the Philippines and met perhaps some of those same populations that you met. And she told me that they didn't know anything about Africa. I had another colleague of mine, a young student, who, who visited the communities in uh, Malaysia. And he told me they don't have a clue about Africa. They know that they are the first people in that area. Yeah. And they know that yeah. they've been persecuted by other people. But in terms of a direct connection to Africa, specifically what part of Africa they might have come from, I've never gotten any information on that. OK, this is a <laughs> question from Kayla Fadiai. Uh, the Aboriginal Australian, do they have a similar ceremonies like Africa, you know, similar to Africans? Like, is their spirituality a bit similar to Africans, would you say, or different? Or I would say the indigenous people of Australia that I've encountered, I've maybe 10 times, are the most spiritual people I've ever encountered. Wow. You know, so in terms of, I think that certain areas exude spirituality. And Australia is one of those very, very special places. I cannot really say, for the most part, if we could compare their spiritual or, uh, uh, or religious or spiritual systems to any part of Africa. But I will say that they are very, very, very spiritual people. And that's something that really deserves a lot more explanation. I mean, exploration. Okay. okay. Two questions left. Okay. This is from Patrick Graham. Um, basically... He wants to know about the, the people in the Pacific Islands. Have people living there? How, how long have they been there before the Asians and before the Europeans, the Pacific Islanders? I think that we can easily trace the people of, in the Pacific Island back perhaps 30,000 years. Okay. Okay. And one last question from, this is from me. And 
It's just about um, Samaria, because I think we left that out before, so I better pop yeah. that in. Samaria, the African presence in Samaria, like I'm talking about, whether you know, around the Egyptian times and the Kemet, and because you know, the, the this big rivalry of Samaria is older than Africa. You know, you could just, um, I'm getting sick and tired of hearing this one, so you know, there is the I guess you could say the parent civilization of Southwest Asia is Sumer, Sumer, S U M E R, and Sumerians call themselves the black headed people. Yeah, physically, they were, uh, they seem to make a distinction. Um, the oldest, most exalted deity there is called Anu, A N U. And this is a name that we find associated with thriving black populations at the dawn of history. We have the fact that the Sumerians had a matrilineal line of descent. They seem to have a matriarchal social structure. That is something that ties them in with other ancient uh, black or African civilizations, yeah. the prominence yeah. of the female. Mm -hmm. You have an important figure named Kubaba, it may have been mythical, but um, she's identified as a powerful female ruler. This is very unlike Aryan, the Aryan civilizations or the civilizations of early Europeans. You have the evidence of physical anthropology. So you have a direct link with Africa. You have the biblical traditions that says that Cush begat Nimrod and Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth and he went forth into the land of Shinar or Sumer. So there's a direct connection, but there's no doubt that Nile Valley civilization is the oldest of those two civilizations. And that, if anything, Nile Valley uh, civilization had a profound influence on the early people of Sumer. I think that people gravitate towards Sumer simply because it's not in Africa. Yeah. And we are still yeah. grappling with an anti-African bias. And so people have said Sumer came first because they wanted to deny the primacy of Africa. And I think that gets to the crux of the matter. I know we're out of time. I would recommend if people want uh, further information, Get my books. Even in the UK, you have my book, African Star Over Asia, The Black Presence in the East. Uh, feel free to reach out, contact me, go to my website, drrenoco.com. Email me at renoco at hotmail.com because it's a vast conversation. But I'm pleased that we were able to at least introduce the subject and talk about the totality of the global African experience before, during, and after the slave trade. Okay, we've got five minutes left. Um, if I could ask also Saudi Arabia and Yemen and Oman, these areas, you know, dealing with the say roundabout, I understand the first people that left Africa like 90,000, 80,000 years. So, dealing with the round about 10,000 years in the last 10,000 years, how would you describe these areas before they changed? I would say 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. Those, those were black people living there. Yeah. And this is easy. I mean, the only thing that separates the Arabian Peninsula, particularly Yemen, uh, from Africa is the Red Sea. And I believe that they're, you know, from the, a place called the Bab el Mandeb, which is a part of, I believe, Somalia, that you can actually see Yemen from there. And so it's very, very easy to see how this area would be a kind of a, a crossroads if you will, from Africa to Asia. There are a group of people, large black population in South Asia called the Tamils. The Tamils do not believe they come from Africa. They believe that there was a massive uh, land bridge, a continent now submerged underneath the Indian Ocean that connected East Africa with South Asia. And that different groups of black people walked back and forth. Wow. Now, normally I would dismiss that. But I think that all of these things point to a level of scholarship that we need to, uh, uh, to, to strive to seek out. And so Kurt, certainly the Arabian Peninsula would have been part of that. Well, have you been to, I went to Madagascar last year. Uh, have you been to Madagascar? Uh, I haven't been to the Malagasy Republic. I admire you, my brother. You've done a lot of travel. I wasn't aware of that. Oh, you know, I've got the same kind of spirit as you. I mean, with <laughs> Madagascar, uh, what I found is the, I was trying to think, who are the indigenous people? Obviously, it's Africans, right. but he was saying people came, Austronesians came from Indonesia, the same mm -hmm. time of when they were going into the Pacific areas. So I was re researching it, and then and I found that, well, there's evidence like 10,500 years ago, they knew that from an elephant bed, 
and he said that um, with this elephant beard, it was a, it's an extinct mammal about 10,000 years ago, and the eggs that they laid were so huge, you could cook 50 omelets out of them. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, I mean, I had to really search and, re- you know, it's one thing going to the rainforest thing, but, you know, I'm all around the streets when I go places as well. You know, I can I'll speak to random people on the streets. I'll have, you know, just like yourself, you know, it's research is not just only about picking up a book, is it? It's field work and, you know, and... It's all of that. It's all of we that, need to yeah. Study everything that we can get, but there's nothing like primary research primary to bring research, it home. Yeah. And it seems like you've done a lot of primary research, my brother, and I appreciate that. Oh, of course. So I hope that you've inspired me so much. First of, yeah, well, we inspire each other and we need each other. Yeah. We're all we've got. And we have to learn to work together and, and humble ourselves to the point that we don't know everything. Yeah. But there are many things that are knowable if we work together and we're able to um, submerge our egos for the common good. So let's be about that. Well, I'm, I'm almost like about 40 countries now, but you, you are like 125. Amazing, my brother. You're the king. <laughs> well, you still, have a, you still have a lot of time on your hands, my brother. That's it. Well, we've got this thing going on now. Let's hopefully we can get back to normal and do what we do. Let's best. hope so. Brother but, James, I appreciate you, man. I really appreciate you, my brother. And the Caribbean, you've done, you done a great talk, you've done a great talk at the Caribbean Centre, you know, because Liverpool's a bit different than Manchester, London, I I'm sure you've seen that. So I'm just trying to bring that solid Africanness. you know, that's what I'm about. I'm a Nigerian descent and Trinidad, but, you know, I gravitate more to me Nigerian ancestry because I can point to, I'm, I'm the Ijo tribe. And I'm sure, I know you've been in Nigeria a few oh, times now. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, if they definitely can get you back on one time, maybe you can do ancient do the do, go right through the Americas one time, Africans in Europe, and definitely we got to um, get you on us in. We just want to cover the whole world with you. I agree. You be well, my brother. Talk to you soon. Ah, uh, bless my brother, and I'll see you again. Thank you very much. All right. Ah, uh, bless. Thank you very much for discovering. This is James Debo, and it's been an excellent show. And then we're going to be hopefully having Renoko again one time, once when he's free. But I appreciate all his time. And we're going to do it again one time. And thank you very much on Big Condo Radio. And hopefully again, we'll get Renoko Rashidi back in. <laughs>